Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week, you may have noticed, we have a guest. Ollie looks a bit different, doesn't he? Yeah, so we are joined by Tom Sturdy, frame builder and 3D printing guru. And we're going to discuss if the days of carbon fibre being seen as the wonder material are over, and if there's a new material coming to take over. Hence why Tom's here. We've also got a new mounted mic from Pinarello. We've got some Speedy Boy all conditioned tyres. We've got some graphene and silver infused kit and a gadget to kill all those germs in your water bottle. Fantastic. Let's do it. Before we get into our main talking point this week, let's have a little bit of an introduction to who Tom is. Now, some of you regular viewers may already recognise him because he has been on a few videos before, but he has qualifications in aerospace engineering, sports biomechanics, and has 10 years frame bil building experience and started Sturdy Cycles back in 2014. Tom, that's quite an intro. That's it's not pretty bad, good. Is it? Yes. Pretty good, thank yeah. you. Um, well, yeah, thanks for joining us today. So, as I mentioned in the intro, carbon fibre has been sort of deemed as the wonder material for quite a while now. I guess you can make it light, you can make it strong, and you can pretty much make lots of different shapes. Is that kind of right for carbon fibre? Yeah, it's certainly become the, the most popular material that most bike parts are manufactured yeah. from in the last few years. But we're here to talk about something different, because you don't really tend to work in carbon fibre. 3D printed titanium, is your sort of like USP, I guess. So first thing I think we should probably chat about is a bit of an explainer on what actually is 3D printing, because it's a pretty broad subject, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. 3D printing as a sort of title covers a huge, huge sort of range of different processes. We're really talking about additive manufacturing, um, which is different from conventional manufacturing where you would start with a, a block of material and remove material from that. Whereas with additive manufacturing, you start with effectively nothing or some raw material in either powder form or filament form, and then you create a shape from, from that. Basically. So all of this stuff in front of us is 3D printed, but like the part in front of Manon is like plastic, I guess. This stuff is titanium. So what's the, is there a difference in how that's made? Yeah, so um, we've got different materials here. This is a, a plastic, well, it's a nylon and carbon fibre mixture, and we've got a resin print there, um, uh, which is a, a sort of made from a, a, a liquid, mm -hmm. um, and then all the way through to different metal parts. So this is um, titanium that's printed using one process, and then these other parts are printed using a slightly different printing process. Um, but yeah, they, they all broadly work in the same way in that you're starting with raw material, and in the case of metal printing, that's nearly always a powder of some description, or so, so, so like a, either a loose powder or in the form of, in this machine, it's, it's a powder that's been sintered together. Um, and then you will make one layer at a time and build a part up um, from a series of cross sections. Okay, no, that's really interesting. What are the benefits of doing it this way? So um, the main benefit really is that you can create geometries that you couldn't create in uh, a conventional sense. So for example, to manufacture this part from metal using conven conventional methods would be impossible. Um, so it does allow you to use metal for applications where previously you might not have been able to. Um, the way that I build bikes is that e each one is unique, so each one will have a unique geometry and a unique structure to suit their rider, and, and that's where additive manufacturing has real advantages because you can build in complexity and um, different sort of geometries without having to create new tools for each one. So uh, a, a moulded carbon fibre part, for example, you can create complex geometries, but you have to create tooling to make that part. Um, and then if you wanted to make a change to that part, you'd have to create new tooling. Sometimes you can create tooling that has a range of um, flexibility in it so that you can create slightly different geometries. But for me, it means that I can create completely unique shapes from one build to another. When you're saying about tooling for making stuff in carbon fibre um, and the associated cost of it, give us some sort of ballpark figure, say, I don't know, a 
a wheel or frame manufacturer. They want to make a mould for a carbon fibre frame. Presumably they've got to do it in lots of different sizes. So are we talking like £10,000 more? Like, or? It would be different for different manufacturing facilities, okay. depending on how much, you know, how much the equipment they own themselves versus how much they outsource. But, you, but you're right, you know, there's a huge amount of cost and time and work built into yeah. the tooling to produce a thing. So you know, um, we, we produce frames on a really small scale compared to those big manufacturers and with a really small team. Yeah. Um, and so you know, managing and making the extent of tooling that you might need to would be impossible for us, especially to then offer uh, one-off sort of unique sizing. Yeah. Um, so y y the cost of the parts themselves for me would be significantly more expensive than a mm -hmm. part produced from a composite mold or something like that. But then the trade-off is the, the tooling needed to do it and the versatility that that gives, gives me. So for example, cranks, um, can easily be produced in any length, pretty much that will fit within the um, one six two point five. Yeah, <laughs> that's tiny. Too tiny. That we've is. done shorter than that. We've gone down to one hundred and ten. I think was the shortest we've done. That's crazy. Yeah. So Manon has actually got a little bit of frame building experience. Very little bit. Very little. <laughs> so you you um, you actually headed to visit Moots last year, and I guess they're working with titanium as well. But the process that of how you're going about building a bike is quite different to like the traditional method, I guess, isn't it? Because you've got a normal sort of titanium tube through the main section of the frame and then the 3D printed part. So I guess, would you call it like a hybrid construction or how would you describe it? Um, yeah, I guess, well, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a mixture of using sort of additive manufacturing and then the, that conventional like drawn tubing. There's a frame behind me um, that shows it. Um, Lots of different companies are starting to use additive manufacturing in areas where you can offset the cost of the process. So the process, when you went to Moots, they um, they use additive manufacturing for their dropouts on the on their bikes, and that was that's pretty much one of the most common applications for it in in frame building because with disc brakes. Um, in, certainly in metal construction, there's a lot of challenges with creating um, the interface at the back, especially on the brake side of the bike. So fabricating that out of metal leads to a number of challenges, and by printing that whole unit in one hit, you can remove a lot of those challenges. Yes, the, the material cost will be more, but you're, you're offsetting that against making your life a bit easier in a number of ways. And, and it's sort of from there that um, it, it can evolve. Um, and yeah, there are, um, yeah, apart from myself, there are a lot of different companies starting to adopt it in that way. Go on, yeah, you go. Oh, okay, I'll go then. <laughs> um, so, yeah, saying about other companies starting to adopt maybe 3D printing or the titanium as a material, it wasn't actually that long ago that Canyon announced they were starting to have a partnership with, I can't remember the name of the company, but they worked with recycled titanium, I mm -hmm. seem to believe. So I guess, do you see like a shift towards titanium being used a bit more instead of carbon fiber, or what's your sort of thoughts? I think that the technology has been used for actually quite a long time now, yeah. and, and a lot of manufacturing centers are now sort of getting to the stage where they can offer parts you know, cheaper and, and uh, certainly within the realms of what's making it commercially viable for more and more companies to consider it. But um, there are a lot of challenges with it being adopted in a, in a mainstream sense. Uh, and that's you know, as much to do with the commercial side of how the bicycle industry works as it is to do with the technical side. You know, so you, we've got different printed parts here um, that are printed out of the same material, yeah. but using different processes. And the design for those two parts would be fundamentally quite different. The mechanical properties of them are quite different. So you, the, the, the design of it is very, very involved with the manufacturing. Um, but the bicycle industry on the whole is set up where design and manufacturing aren't that close together, okay. or certainly are separated by, you know, different companies or different teams of people. Um, and so there's definitely a challenge with being able to adopt the technology from, from that sense. Um, it's, it's been quite an expensive and uh, painful learning <laughs> process. Yeah, because um, like well, like you say, the, you've got, in effect, so the same material here, like 
Manon's got one of these pieces over on her side, but they're like this is this is quite a, a like rough finish, I'd guess. Mm -hmm. Whereas, say the crank is a relatively smooth finish. But are these kind of like the same raw material? It, it's pretty much so. It's the same alloy of titanium yeah. um, that's been printed, but because they've been printed using different printing processes, so different machines, but, mm -hmm. but fundamentally a different process, um, you actually end up with completely different mechanical properties. So you can't really just print this part using this machine, let's say, and expect the end result to be the same. Mm -hmm. So um, you then have to optimize a design of a particular component or part, knowing what the, uh, what the properties of that material are coming out. And that, that's the same for any design process, really. Um, but it just kind of highlights, I think there's a, definitely a perception with printing that where you can just draw a thing in a computer and press print and out it comes. And, and actually, it's, it's a lot more involved than that and, and are probably a lot more restrictive than people think. And so there's a number of challenges with it being adopted on a wider scale that are not just about the technology itself. It's just how that sort of sits within a company's sort of design and product life, okay. lifespan. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So talking about the design elements and aspects and how, I guess, a, a big bicycle company is set up to sell a lot of bikes, obviously. that's It just works off of the sheer scale. Mm -hmm. um, but you're making individual components. So say, I'm trying to think how I can explain this. You're working with this part and you're about to weld it together. And you go, oh, do you know what? I don't like that part or it doesn't work particularly well. You can literally turn around, go to the other side of the workshop, change the design on the computer, and then when the 3D printed part arrives, you've kind of like got the solution to your problem all in control of yourself in-house. Yeah, so that's definitely one of the ways that uh, yeah, I've been able to adopt it as much as I have and as, as quickly as I have is that in, in my challenge is that because I'm producing not just a frame but fork, handlebars, cranks, a lot of parts that the big manufacturers are also producing. So I'm having to do all of that work as a much smaller team, which yeah. in itself, that's, that's a huge challenge. But um, one of the advantages is that, that yeah, I, I'm the person fabricating the frames, I'm the person finishing the frames. Um, and so because we're not investing in tooling, um, but we're investing in the parts, we can iterate much quicker. So for example, a lot of the design work that goes into this part has got almost nothing to do with the how the end user will use the part and much more to do with how I might fabricate the frame and it might improve the reliability of whatever process it is, whether it be the welding or the finishing or you know, some aspect like that. And so I've been able to optimize um, really kind of specific parts of the process much quicker than you might otherwise because I'm the person doing it. That's oh, cool. One question I had is something you said earlier about each kind of frame being a set geometry to mm -hmm. that person. How do you determine the geometry for the rider? Yeah, so that, that's something that um, I've done ever since I started building frame. I mean, that's sort of why I got into to frame building in the first place is um, uh, when I was studying engineering and I was racing myself and I was always interested in that link between rider and bike and how, you know, there's some bikes that you just get on with better than others and it, I didn't quite understand that whereas on you know in terms of the paper spec it wouldn't necessarily add up um, and so yeah a big part of what I've always done as a frame builder is try to understand what a particular rider might want um, and convert that into a geometry and, and a, a structure that's going to produce that so um, yeah that that's come from years of nerdy experimenting <laughs> building lots of good and lots of really bad bikes for myself and friends and you know people like that so to to try and understand that relationship more but that in itself is a huge topic i mean there's there's so many ways to answer that question in the sense that there's not just one geometry that's going to suit one particular mm. person it's sort of my interpretation of it i guess so on the basis of what we've discussed already and like the scale and how different industries can adopt the technology and use it, something that springs to mind in more recent times is the Ghana Owl Record bike, which was well the initials of one that was used and you've seen images on online, mm -hmm. was 3D printed. A couple of questions around that. How come it wasn't just 3D printed in one giant 
piece in one go, because in my head it seems like that would make more sense. Mm -hmm. And do you think, I guess the crux of this whole conversation, do you think we're ever actually going to get to the point where 3D printed bikes as a whole are commonplace? Yeah, so, I mean, so that, that bike's a really good example um, of a bike that is essentially it is the, 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 the frame or the, the sort of... The core of the it. The core of the yeah. bike is entirely 3D printed, um, but yeah, not done in one hit. And, and that's, that's a lot down to um, design constraints in terms of it can be limited by the physical size of the machine that produces it. So, um, oh, yeah. you know, so uh, the machines can only work within a certain volume. Um, and there are really big machines now, but it, it's also, um, so it's what will practically fit inside a machine, um, but also what will get the end result right. So for example, a lot of these parts here, uh, you might be able to see that not all of it looks the same. There's bits of it that have been machined. And that's because 3D printing only gives you a certain tolerance in terms of you know, what you've got, that shape in the computer that you've got. That's not what you're going to get out. It's going to be distorted a little bit from that, and how it distorts will be influenced by quite a wide range of factors, but one of them is how it's built inside that machine. So, for example, if you were to able to fit a bike frame into one of the machines you would have to choose what orientation to print it in and that would have an impact on how accurately certain aspects of it came out uh. and, and essentially it's a constant trade-off between bits that you want to get good and bits that you don't. So basically what it comes down to is it wouldn't be a very efficient use of the machine to print it in one go because then there'd be a lot of work afterwards to get the bits that didn't come out right to work. Okay. So for example, headsets. Yeah. You know, you're interfacing with a a machined part or bottom brackets and that sort of stuff. So um, it's not always about just being able to get the biggest thing out in one hit. You have to consider how you're going to use that afterwards, what it's going to interface with. Um, so yeah, that, that's essentially why it wasn't printed in one go. In theory, that can be done. You know, there are machines now that are producing really big structures from metal and other materials. Um, but depending on what you're wanting to get out of it, that actually might still not be the best way of okay. um, achieving the end result. Well, okay. well, on that basis then, I guess the million dollar question, do you think we're going to see 3D printed titanium eventually overtake carbon in terms of popularity and volume? And if so, when do you think that might be? It's a really difficult question to answer. You have uh, to say yes. Yeah, you we have gonna, to. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're not going to allow you to leave until you've said, <laughs> said yes. I think at some point in the future, you're going to see it um, used quite widely mm -hmm. on um, on bikes that everyday consumers would end up using. There's a lot of uh, challenges with it replacing carbon fiber, mm -hmm. full stop, because there are still some applications where a molded part might make most sense. Um, but certainly the technology is becoming more and more prevalent and people are understanding how to use it more effectively um, and, and companies are able to adopt it more and more. Um, the cost of it is also coming down um, gradually. So, yeah. Well, well, it's interesting. Time. So you think, yeah, it might be. Uh, Manon, would you be all for more 3D printed titanium? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm all for mm. it. Not only does it look cool, we get those super crazy finishes as well. I love the mm. look of that stuff. Yeah. Um, all right, Mega. Mm. Done? Done. All right. Um, let us know in the comments section down below your thoughts on 3D printed titanium. That's enough about me. Time for some uh, hot, spicy tech. Yep, and this week we are kicking off with oh. our new helmet sponsor, Met. And you're going to see us rocking around in these lovely helmets. And we've also got an Aero Bad Boy too. Yeah, we Very gave fancy. we gave Tom the Aero Bad Boy. It's called the drone. Um, primarily, I guess you're going to see us in this, the Trenta, yep, or the have... Manta. Manta, um, Aero. We've set this one aside for Ollie. Do you feel like this is what a helmet Ollie would wear? Oh, I reckon he'd wear that right into work, wouldn't he? That, it probably would be his commuter helmet. I see him going up and down the hill on his time trial bike sometimes. There you go. Um, With his Strava on for the whole 3K. With Strava on. Yeah, these are really nice. So, yeah, you're going to see us using these helmets. We've got more in the coming years, I guess. Yeah. Love it. Um, next, I'm in hot tech. I don't know. Did you watch the Mountain Bike World Cup? I actually weekend? did. You did? Yeah. 
Tom? I did, yeah. Oh, wow. It was I'm, sick. I was it was good. rad. It was rad. It was, um, <laughs> hang on, wait. Um, What's the number one? It was shredding it. Shredding it. Dropping in. Dropping in. All of that stuff. <laughs> anyway, um, the most important bit that I've noticed really was Pinarello launched their new mountain bike, their cross country full suspension mountain bike. It's been floating around the last handful of mountain bike races, flying mm. under the radar actually, all with the logos all blacked out. Um, Pinarello said they've effectively built a cross country mountain bike purely off of the feedback of what Tom Pidcock has given them. So he's gone, hey guys, I want the bike to do this, 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 and this. And they've gone, yeah. All right. Um, there you if, go. Yeah, so if you want all of the details about this bike, um, I guess the guys on GMBN will cover it. Yeah. But two do. things that I found particularly interesting, the rear triangle of the bike, two separate halves rather than being linked together, which I think is unusual. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, that's, that's um, not so common. Normally it'd be linked by a yoke. Yeah, all right. And the rear shock mounts underneath the top tube and you can change the position of it to change the suspension travel. Very cool. Yeah, cool, all right. Um, if you want to watch more mountain biking, it's actually available on GCN Plus. Mm, got a bit of everything over there now. Track, yeah. road. Mountain bike, cyclocross. Everything. You know, we got it. Haven't got hand cycling though, sorry about that. You never know, one day. Right, next up in hot tech, we have a pretty cool little gadget. Now, this gadget is from Elite, and it is basically a sterilising, well, steam steriliser for your plastic bottles. Now, Elite are one of our partners here at GCN. Oh, nice pink water bottle, Alex. Celebrating the big Italian bike race. Yeah, you yeah. can watch it over on GCN Plus if you want. Um, this little gadget, you basically have to take your water bottle apart, put it in, you put a bit of water in it, and then you put it in the microwave for one minute, and it sterilizes 99.9% .9 of bacteria, which I think is pretty cool. And that I think, cool. well, I know my bottles get pretty grim just from all the muck, the dirt that yeah. gets on them when you're out on your bike, especially in the winter. So I think this is, um, yeah, quite a cool little gadget. Um, good for uh, like normal kids' bottles, Tom, do you reckon? Yeah, I'd definitely use one of those. Clean all the germs <laughs> out of your kids' water yeah. bottles at home. Yeah. Um, I think it's a neat idea, actually. Yeah, yeah I'm all for that. I uh, wonder if it would have helped Remco out at the Giro this year. Maybe they needed these bottle sterilizers. Don't know if it stops COVID. It's that other 0.1% that always gets you, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we've got a new tyre to talk about as well. Oh, we have. Yes. Here they are. So it is the P0 Race 4S. Manon's current you carry on. on the floor. Um, oh. From Pirelli. So a couple of months ago, Pirelli released an update to their P0 Race TLR, which included the Speed Core liner. Um, so effectively, this is an all-round conditions performance tyre. It's now also being made at their new fancy Italian factory. Um, that's hence why they've integrated the speed core technology into it. To, it acts as a, a surface liner on the inside with aramid fibres wound into it. The idea behind this tyre is to give you, well, all-round performance, as the name suggests. I like it. Do it all. They've also got a um, high-pressure sealant going alongside it as well, so if that's your thing. Tubeless, set you up, ready to go. Definitely your thing, isn't it? Oh, I'd love tubeless tyres. Well, you, you like tubeless? Yeah, I've run tubeless for a while. You're not so Yeah, yeah I am. You are, oh, Just not as passionate as you. Oh, it is a banned subject in our workshop. Uh, <laughs> all right, um, if it's banned subject, let's move on from that, shall we? Got some new kit next. So Q3 6.5 have been kind enough to send us in a lovely wrapped present. How um, nice is that? This is from their climber range. Tom, you're the guest on the show. I'm going to allow you to unwrap that, but you only have a couple of seconds. That's it. Get right there in there. Oh, very delicate. Thanks. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about this um, clothing because it has. Go on, rip it. Go on, don't get in there. Oh, socks. Very nice. No messing around. Over the shoulder. Go on. So oh, got some mitts. Um, so we've got all sorts of stuff here. So the clothing is using a graphene yarn, and it's also got... <laughs> Why are you laughing at me saying graphene, graphene yarn? yarn. <laughs> it's also got silver incorporated into threads of the bib shorts. The idea is it's to maintain the body's most efficient core temperature, which is 36.5. I hope that's stretchy. Yeah, you know so. <laughs> um, 36.5 degrees, Mal, is the most effective core body temperature. It is everybody's, is that the same for everybody? The same well, I mean, core you body think temperature? So. I did Google this, right? Oh, God. Um, oh, according to Google, if your core body temperature reaches 44 degrees Celsius, almost certainly death will occur. 
I, I don't think you're too far from that. Yeah, probably not. Um, anybody inter interested can in I, why there's silver can, can, in there? Yeah, why is there silver in there? Oh, but... Tom, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Q3 6.5 have said, real silver thread has been introduced into the weft of the fabric, not only offering antibacterial and conductivity advantages, but the thread also protects against anti, no, protects against electromagnetic smog, which reduces muscle fatigue. That's pretty cool. I wasn't expecting cycling kit to do all that. It's more high tech than I'd anticipated. Can, can I just, how cool is this band that goes around the shorts? I mean, if you're packing to go on a cycling holiday, how good would it be to have this band? You can just wrap your shorts up really neatly. Yeah, all right. Anybody else interested and think that's cool? Yeah. Or is that just me? I mean, it all looks the part, don't I? It like does. This. That is, that little detail in there, I love that. Wow. Well, mm. Look at the, um, the logo. is cool. They're really nice. Yes, please. More of that. I like it. I mean, it. The, the only question is, who's that, who does this actually fit? It's a medium. Medium. I can squeeze into a medium. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that laugh. Yeah, I should probably have a large. Um, anyway, we should move on Very because nice. Peloton recently this week announced a recall on a load of their exercise bikes. The recall affects, I think, nearly 2.2 million of the bikes that are currently out in the market Watches. is to do with a potential fault with a saddle, which is leading to some injuries of people. So if you have a Peloton bike, head over to their website and make sure and double check where the recall A saddle injury out. does not sound pleasant. I read online there have been reports of multiple people with broken wrists from this summer. A wrist? No idea. Oh. Um, tool news next, because Park Tools have released a number of different tools recently. My favorite of those is the little tool which holds the bottom bracket tool in place. So I don't know if you've seen this. You know the external cups? Yep. So they've now made a tool which slides through the bottom bracket, threads into the back half of the cup which goes over the bottom bracket and then you put your driver on the outside and it stops it slipping saves, off. Saves your knuckles. Saves your knuckles, stops it slipping off and damaging your titanium bottom bracket. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, that's it for Hot Tech. We are now gonna fight over who gets to keep the kit. Um, more Hot Tech next week. It's now time for comments of the week, and because I am going to refuse to ever do a rap for the start of it... We'll get one gonna, out of you one day. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> we're going to play the intro where Connor raps, so cue that now. It's time for comment of the week, where we look for someone who is a meek on the tech show, where we like to grow and flow with the beats. You know what I mean. Tech show comment of the week. Tom, you've missed out on that, but you can go back and watch it. Oh, right, okay. um, so, first comments from underneath last week's tech show. Rob, um, do you want to read this one out? You can if you want. Oh, okay, thanks. Rob is saying, I enjoyed your conversation about faster speeds these days, and truly, the Pro Peloton is noticeably faster. It's amazing, and great to see the host, um, the show hosted by Ollie and Felix. Why do people still pretend they don't know my name? We don't. <laughs> Another comment under the show was from Alex. That's, was that you? Is that you, Alex? <laughs> I don't know. Is your not, name Alex? It's not my name. Don't know. Whatever. Um, that's crazy when you put the times into perspective like that. It's mad how much quicker bikes have gotten. Yeah, it's so last true. week we were saying how pro cycling is getting faster and faster and it's basically all down to tech. Some people are saying it's drugs. We disagree. <laughs> I hope it's not drugs. Yeah. Um, so underneath the tech video where you were trying to qualify for the Gravel Worlds, which... I still haven't been able to see these videos yet. For all you know, I might have qualified. Oh, yeah, you could have done. Actually, yeah. Uh, you did it? No. I didn't. Oh, okay. It didn't go very well. Um, <laughs> Kim Miller. Um, Tom, do you want to read one of the comments out? Uh, yeah, Kim says, uh, um, I've had those redshift stock stem and seat post on bikes for years now. The difference is worth it, and I'm sure you'll appreciate them. Did you appreciate them? I, I honestly did. I never used them before, but after that, they make the world of difference. <laughs> I, did, I wasn't fatigued in my upper body, just my legs. Um, but yeah, definitely. Have you tried them? No. Nope. Definitely recommend them. All right, thanks. Nick Brown Bill says, it looks like a chemistry lab or something. As an industrial research chemist, I wish my lab was that clean, tidy, and modern. Very interesting video. Good? Was it good and clean? Did you, did you watch that video as well? No, I didn't watch that video. You don't know what, you don't know what he's on about, do you? Well, it sounds great. Uh, I'm just going to read the other comments <laughs> now. I feel like I've been there. Neil says, um, I think once it's covered in mud and sand, those lovely colour highlights don't count, but it's a stunning bike. The bike was absolutely filthy. Can like, we have a picture of the bike now? Yeah, cue the picture of the bike. Cheers, Isaac. 
And the, and the worst thing was, um, I had to give it back to Argon 18 after the race and I didn't clean it, so they just had the <laughs> You just gave it back on mud. sand and mud, yeah. Tom, would you stand for that if someone gave a demo well, bike back to you? I didn't have bike washing equipment out in Denmark with me, didn't have a hose pipe. I don't know, dirty bike's all right, isn't it? It's oh, been yeah. used. All right. <laughs> um, so also, some comments underneath my budget bike build. Yes. Um, episode one and two has been out. Now look, I've got a couple of bits I want to address here, and I'm I'm interested you had a to hear your little, thoughts. A little bit of abuse, didn't you? Like some people are not happy about the fact that I've reused some components from previous videos in my budget bike build, right? And people are getting a bit upset and getting their bib shorts in a twist about it. <laughs> Um, I want to hear your thoughts. So what I've done is reused some components I had and then I've taken the value off of the budget of the Bike Build series. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Which, in my eyes, makes complete sense. Mm. I've got a set of wheels that I purchased for £300 for a Build series last year, so I took £300 off of the budget. I think I can kind of see both sides of the, st of the story. Yeah. I think I've done it in the past where I've built a bike and used things that we've had laying around in GCN and HQ. And I think it's a waste to not use the stuff we already yeah. have and we're just going out and buying more. So yeah. I think, yeah, I think it is, I think you're you right. Think it's acceptable. Doing, yeah, I, definitely, yeah. I think it'd be worse if you went out, you already had a set of wheels, be like, oh, I'm not going to use them, I'm going to go and get a new just pair. Just buy more. Yeah. We don't have an endless budget, we need to save some budget for beer money at the bike festival. <laughs> um, Tom, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think, oh, well, I mean, it's pretty common, isn't it, as a as cyclist to have a pool of stuff that you yeah. might use one day on a build and to use that, so... I'm glad you both said that. Can I tell you one I more think... bit of information? Here we go. I had a used Dura A set of cranks. I allocated £100 to the budget. People were upset that I under, undervalued them somewhat. Okay, maybe. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add the budget off a bit different next time. Um, OK, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad I've got that off my chest and you two kind of half agreed with me. Yeah. All right, uh, more comments next week. Keep them coming, we love reading them out. Not the nasty ones, though. <laughs> no. Now time for the bike fold, and this is the part of the show where we vote your bike to be nice or super nice, and if it is super nice, it goes into the bike vault forever and ever, ever, and the bell gets rung. And Tom, you're going to do the honours of ringing the bell today, okay. if there are any super nices. Yeah, that's even nice or super nice. Mm. Like, well, the first one has actually been voted the most super nice bike. And this one is in from Christian Pedrera Garcia. Good job on the name on that. Got oh, that. I'll probably got um, what, what are we thinking, I'm guys? Are you sure this is correct? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not convinced. App Squad told me this was the most super nice bike from last week. I mean, week. if our GCN app users think this is acceptable to have as the most super nice bike, it's right. actually quite appalling. I'm going to throw it out there. Tom, nice or super nice? Well, I think we need some more pictures to judge it properly, don't we? <laughs> well, yeah, this that's is it. True. This is the picture that we are going off, and well, if it's been voted nice, then I suppose we've got to put it down as nice, haven't we? Well, just no. This was super nice. This was super, like, super, super nice. nice. Super yeah. nice. I still think we need some more pictures. All right. It's a nice. Okay, jury's out on that one. Next one in, David Liu. Next with a Moots for Moots CR. Oh, lots of chat about Moots today. Yeah. yeah. Um, Interesting angle. Yeah, it's on laid the floor. on the floor. <laughs> but I, arty. We've got a lot of gubbins on there. Oh, it's not doing it for me. No, nah, I'm not happy about it. Has, it definitely has potential. It's not in the correct gear. It's laid over, the cranks aren't aligned, valves aren't aligned, unnecessary accessories in the picture. And. When you put it like it's that. Not even upright. Well, they crashed. <laughs> I have done. <laughs> um, Tom, you can have a casting vote on this. Well, I mean, it sounds like you're pretty, pretty committed to your, your stance on that. Just a I, nice? Yeah, just a nice. All right, cool. That's a nice. Uh, Malon, who's next? Pierre. Yeah. WXP. Yeah. <laughs> Giant Contend. <laughs> oh. One, I, it's in the shade, half of it. That is a, it looks like quite a risky angle to lean the bike up it against. It does look like it's off the, on the edge of a precipice, doesn't it? Mm. A what? Lots of danger down in that oh. bit. Precipice. You can't use fancy words like that. No? I don't have is a that fancy? Clear. To me, it is. It's, it's from the Aerosport. Oh. The Aerosport. <laughs> Aerosport by the Precipice. Great Ball. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, my God. Um, right, let's get back to serious business here. 105, though. 105, group set of people. Um, it's hard to see the valve on the rear wheel. It is in the correct gear, but it's it letting up against gear. a tree. Nice. It's dangerous, yeah. Um, Colin 
Aileen next. A very comfy bike. It's a Tri Rig Omni. Oh. oh. Is this, is this Does something that. Does it Nikes on? Look, they're overshoes. Is this a triathlete? <laughs> is it a triathlete? <laughs> if it is, are we allowed to comment? Yeah, yeah, we do. On, it, on the bike being super nice or not? Well, yeah, we can comment on that. You've dabbled in triathlon. I have, yeah. You're I've friends passed. with Mark Throwful. You went to uni together. We did, yeah. Oh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, those overshoes have to go. Well, I love those. I they're, know you do. They're like an actual shoe that I would wear. Yeah. <laughs> not on the bike. Sorry, not doing it for me. Okay. Bike is very interesting, though. So what is it? Is it nice from you, is it? Yeah, it's a nice from me. Tom? <clears throat> uh, no, I can't, can't say I like that bike. Nice all round, then. Okay. Um, and then I think is that it. We don't have any more for this week. Oh, that was the last one. Yeah, all right. Last bike oh. in the bike vault this week. Always goes way too fast. Um, sorry if we've rambled on for a long time, but Tom, it was blooming incredible having a good chat all about 3D printing and titanium. I've enjoyed it. Manon, have you enjoyed it? Oh, I've loved every single minute of it. Did you enjoy being there? Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, cool. Aww, and remember, um, let us know in the comments section down below your thoughts on 3D printing and titanium. And if you've got any questions, file them down there as well. Right, see you later.